So, um, uh, breakfast with Socrates. Now, who is Socrates? Uh, he's understood, as you will know, to be the uh, father, I guess, of modern philosophy and framed a lot of thinking for us in the West. And this is perhaps his most famous quote, the unexamined life is not worth living, um, which was sort of caught in his last days. Um, as you may or may not know, Socrates was ultimately assassinated. He was poisoned. So actually the idea of having breakfast with Socrates is probably not entirely wise. But, um, and the reason he got assassinated was because uh, he kept on examining things and examining them ad infinitum. And it got up quite a lot of people's noses, actually. And in the end, the state couldn't bear the fact that, that, that there was this natural, inquisitive dissident who was uh, pulling the rug from under people's feet. And he ended up being characterized as a gadfly, you know, like a mosquito or something. But he did say the unexamined life is not worth living. And I think the point there is it's very easy to sleepwalk through your life and just continue on the tracks that you've been set up on. And um, I was thinking about, I've been doing a few radio things recently, and I've been thinking about the way in which politics in particular uh, gets polarized into very simple positions these days, you know, left wing or right wing, for example. And you get very stuck in certain ways of, of thinking and conceptualizing ideas. And Socrates, I think, is, in this sense, uh, a great reminder that thinking doesn't have to be always so simple and doesn't always have to follow the same grid lines. I mean, why does politics always have to be about uh, left and right? Why can't it be about being good or bad, for example? I mean, those might be more interesting questions uh, to, to ask. Now, um, one way of interpreting what he says is to say, all right, uh, let's examine life then, and let's think about the great big themes, you know, love, death, sex, family, truth, religion, and so on. And, of course, there are plenty of, um, uh, plenty of works on those subjects. But I, I've, what I've tried to do is take that even more literally and say, um, what if you were to really think about everyday life, not just the great big themes, but the things we do every single day, and introduce a bit of reflection into those. After all, they're universal. And a lot of the time, we get into routines whereby we don't reflect on them at all. We just get uh, caught up in the, in the rat race, essentially. So um, I tried, therefore, to <laughs> take this idea extremely literally and go through the day and see what the philosophy, psychology uh, of a typical day would be. So we talk about waking up. What's the philosophy of waking up? Uh, well, I talk about Kant and people like that, um, and whether you know you're awake at all in the company of Descartes. <clears throat> it's a good question. I could ask any of you right now to prove that you exist, if you like. Well, we'll come back to the, that at the end. So we start with waking up, getting ready. Uh, we all get ready in the morning. What's really going on? How might, might we think about that? Traveling to work. I don't know if your commute looks like this, but I recommend Nietzsche as a way of improving your commute. Uh, for ways that I'll describe a bit later. Uh, talk about being at work, and I'll concentrate a bit about that uh, today. Having lunch, of course, and in that I talk about Malthus and demography and so on, because one of the things Malthus is interested in it is resources, you know, food. Is there enough food to feed populations? And so I use the idea of lunch to talk about what's going on when people take food and the money involved in that. And particularly when you have lunch with your parents, <coughs> Uh, how does the economy of that work? You know, typically, parents let their children eat first. You know, as a, as a parent, you want to feed your children first. Well, what's going on in that uh, kind of sacrificial, almost sacrificial relationship between parents and children <coughs> that centers on food? Uh, talk about going to the doctor, which is great, because I get to cite what's allegedly the funniest joke in the world. Um, of course, now I've set it up like that. You won't laugh. But a uh, man calls the doctor, rings him up, and says... Uh, Doctor, doctor, um, uh, my friend has just keeled over. I'm terribly, I'm terribly worried about him. I think he might be dead. The doctor says, okay, well, the first thing you need to do is make sure he definitely is dead then. So the man goes off, and a gunshot sounds. Comes back to the phone and says, now what? 
Um, <laughs> The reason it's the funniest joke in the world, apparently, is that there was some poll done of best jokes, and that actually came top across uh, various nations. So we think that humor doesn't travel, but apparently that one sort of withstands, withstands cultural variation. So the next time you find yourself in a uh, travel lodge in you know, Bangkok or something like that, try that out. It might help to break the ice. Uh, so going to the doctor I talk about, um, shopping. Uh, we've got used to this notion that retail therapy but what about the therapy bit in retail therapy? So I talk about Freud there. After all, he's the uh, inventor of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. So what exactly is therapeutic about shopping? Why, you know, what is it that somehow pleases our ego or our id in that practice? I talk about shopping, and to the gym. And the gym, uh, I talk about Bakhtin, who's a Russian philosopher who basically recommends letting yourself go and not going to the gym at all because the <laughs> the more you allow your body to conform to an ideal, the more you're playing into the state's notions of what it is to be a regular citizen. So actually, if you find yourself uh, put in, putting on a few pounds, then you can actually claim that you're a bit of a political, political dissident. Um, taking a bath. Um, there's an extraordinary piece of research, n not known really in the West, by a Japanese guy called Masuro Emoto. Uh, where he studies water. So the chapter talks quite a lot about water. And he takes um, photographs of water crystals from around the world. So he takes samples of water from springs in uh, Japan, and he, he travels to the States and so on. He freezes the water samples and then photographs the crystals. And what's extraordinary is that the crystals in different parts of the world look very different. So in Sapporo, the city of Sapporo, the crystals are really... Uh, ugly and disfigured, but in the spring, where the spring water, they're absolutely beautiful. And then he tries these extraordinary experiments where he plays, it's absolutely bonkers at one level, but he plays bits of music to water crystals and sees what the effect on them is. And so heavy metal kind of produces this, literally an explosion in the shape of the crystals, but when he plays them Bach, they assume this perfect harmonious order. I mean, no kidding. I mean, it's most extraordinary, most extraordinary book. Uh, going to a party, I talk about how to be Machiavellian at a party, uh, and uh, literally talk about Machiavelli, which I'll say something about in a moment. Uh, having sex, that's, uh, I won't be talking much about sex today. Um, you might, unless you force me to. Uh, <clears throat> lunchtime sex always feels a bit funny, I think, so. Uh, and finally, falling asleep, where I talk about Jung and dreams and so on. So that's the idea. It takes Socrates' idea of uh, you know, examining the everyday and applying it very, very literally to everyday life that we all share. And I think if I've got um, an idea that stands behind that, is that thinking helps to set you free. It does release you from a lot of the behaviors and practices that you otherwise get constrained into. And I guess if I've got an agenda, or a shtick of some kind, it, it would be that. So that's the general idea. Um, so I'm going to zoom in a bit and talk about two or three particular examples to see how everyday life can become even more fascinating than it already is. And I'll talk about these two dudes here. Um, the guy at the top, anybody recognize the mugshot from the top? This is a Roman poet, philosopher, theologian called Lucretius. And the guy at the bottom, without his cigar, is obviously Sigmund Freud, indeed. Now, what on earth do they have to do with the concept of getting ready? Well, Lucretius, um, we'll step back a minute. I mean, the, the Greeks and Romans, the classical world as a whole, was very interested in dividing the world into two categories. One is the world of necessity or order, and the other is the world of chaos or chance. And there were debates on either side. Is the world fundamentally orderly, or is it fundamentally chancy or ca and chaotic? And Lucretius, Lucretius essentially said, well, the world is fundamentally a matter of chance. It's uh, predictable up to a certain point, but radically unpredictable beyond that point. And therefore, when it comes to being prepared, and literally when we're getting ready in the morning, there's only so much preparation that you can actually do, because the nature of the world is such that any preparation you do is always likely to be uh, caught out by the chancy nature of events. 
Um, and he talks about the ways in which the world kind of swerves away from you. There's a wonderful Greek uh, um, uh, a term called klinomen, which is the idea of the world swerving away. So he says, there's, in, a, in that sense, there's no point being thoroughly prepared anyway because the world is chancy. And that's quite important because imagine if the world were thoroughly plotted in advance. You'd have no um, sphere, no realm for making choices. There'd be no point in the day where you'd be called upon to make a decision. If everything were perfectly plotted out in advance and programmed, it would be given. You would at no point have to intervene in any way. So the idea of chance, although at one level it might sound scary, is the origin of what makes us free to choose. It's the origin of freedom and free action. And for some people, uh, they'd say it's the origin of free will. You can only have free will if there's chance in the world. If there's no chance, everything's plotted out and there's no point in you acting one way or the other. So it's quite an important uh, concept, and it's very dominant in the classical world, and it's probably coming back again. I mean, on everybody's mind now um, is how on earth the banking crisis happened when we had apparently the most sophisticated economic instruments available for predicting what happened in financial markets, and then, of course, it all went completely pear-shaped. That seems to suggest that the principle of chance still rides very high for all our abilities to map out and predict uh, what might happen with the economy. So in that sense, Lucretius is, is riding high again. Now, um, Freud, <laughs> this is a picture of your mind. Everybody's mind looks like this, according to Freud. Um, and this matters because we go through all the three states of our mind when you, when you get up in the morning. And I'll, I'll describe it because we go through an ego state, we go through a superego state, and we go through an id state just every morning. So let me, let me explain this. So here we go, here's the psyche. It's got three elements, according to Freud. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a wishing function. Freud says everybody, more than anything else, wishes. This is our most basic, fundamental instinct, is to wish or to want or to desire. So rather than, want, you know, rather than trying to establish identity or truth, uh, we fundamentally want to gratify ourselves. This is the most important motive that anybody has. It's the, it's the foundation of the psyche. And Freud uses the word, well, actually, Freud uses the word das Ich, but it gets translated as ego. So the ego uh, is the fundamental thing around which the psyche is based. However, the psyche soon learns that it can't always get what it wants. It wants all the time, but it can't always get what, get, get what it wants. And it meets a figure here called the superego which is the policeman that says no. So the ego says, I want, I want, I want. The policeman says, you can't, you can't, you can't. And this is a fundamental tension that's set up in the psyche very early on. And then little children, according to Freud, feel this. When they're tiny infants, they have the mother all to themselves, and they're in the perfect state of enclosed uh, contentment. Then they realize, uh-uh, I'm actually in competition um, for the mother with the father or a sibling, hence sibling rivalry. So the ego learns early on that there is a superego which comes and stops it having what it wants, which is pretty bad. And what the ego does with that then is say, um, well, what am I going to do with all these wishes that have been repressed or suppressed by the policeman? I'm going to throw them in the bin. And the bin is the unconscious, or what Freud calls the id. But this is how the psyche works, according to Freud. You want something, you can't have it. You have suppressed, repressed desires. They end up in the trash can, which is called the id or the unconscious. So there are three parts to how the psyche works. Now, you go through these phases every morning. When you're dreaming, you're in a kind of id state. You're in an unconscious state, literally unconscious, but also in a psychoanalytically unconscious state where all the repressed wishes that you've had are now swishing around in the form of dreams. So for Freud, dreams are basically the trash can being recycled. It's the recycling bin of your psyche. Uh, that's what dreams are. They're recycled bits of repressed wishes. And you go through it. Before you wake up, that's what's going on in your mind. Then you wake up, and effectively, the, the very first um, moments of your uh, day are, for most of us, structured by the routine we go through. We brush our teeth, we comb our hair, we put on our clothes. And this is the ego doing what it wants, because the ego just loves to have things its own way. It's got its own special routine, and nothing is interrupting it or 
um, adjusting the equilibrium of, of its wanting. It just wants to slob around, it's wearing its pajamas, it's doing its own thing. And that's an ego state, effectively. But as soon as you start to get dressed and think about going to work, you're effectively then beginning to adapt to society. And this is this super egoic function saying, you can't just do what you want. You've got to you know, put on smart clothes if you want to go and give a talk. You, know, you can't just pitch up in your pajamas. That would not be socially acceptable. And we all do that. Every morning we do this. We get dressed uh, to wear what's appropriate for going out. And that is your superego saying you've got to adapt to society. So although it's, um, it's figured here as a rather grisly, dyspeptic policeman, actually the superego is the source of society. It's the very thing that makes us adapt to everybody else. And although Freud is a bit miserable about it in his early career, in his late career, he says this is the source of civilization. So the superego is the thing which creates human relationship because we have to then negotiate our own desires with other people and therefore we create institutions as well as art. And so actually, the superego is the source of society, institutions, and art and aesthetics in Freud. So it's not all bad news. It's bad news for the individual, but it's good for the society as a whole. And we go through those states in the morning. So that's a bit about <laughs> the kind of psychic roller coaster that you uh, happen to be in at you know, 7.30 a.m. every morning. And I'll talk a little bit now about work. So what's going on uh, when you're at work? I think there are two very different ways of uh, approaching this. One is through, there's a clue as to who it is on the slide there, uh, Karl Marx. The other guy is, uh, anybody know? Actually, Max Weber, but um, oh, they all looked the same in the 19th century, didn't they? So, um, and they had two very different conceptions of what work was. Um, now, I, at this point, I'm going to read out the whole of Das Kapital, if that's all right. But no, no, I won't do that. Um, what Marx says, so he takes the basic equation that, that work is about the exchange of labor for money, which is, in a sense, the crudest, most fundamental definition of what work is. You exchange labor for money. It's the most basic principle. And he then says, OK, well, that suggests there's an equilibrium or fairness between the two. But unfortunately, some people put in more labor than they get money, and some people um, do the other way around. So some people are overpaid, and some people are underpaid. So that's the problem with that equation. And for Marx, he says, um, capital basically derives from the fact that some people get paid too much. I mean, there are very far more complicated ways of interpreting Marx, but fundamentally he's saying that in a capitalist society, some people get paid too much, and the extra that they get paid is the origin of capital, basically, because they don't need to spend it. If you get paid more than your immediate needs, you have a bit left over, and that bit left over is capital. Whereas if you get paid more, if you get paid less than what you should be, you don't have much left over, you can't build up any capital, and you remain poor. And hence, a gap opens up between rich and poor. Yeah. Because the equilibrium in the equation between being paid and working is out of kilter. Some people get more, some people get less. That produces capital. Capital makes people rich, and class differences open up. So class is nothing to do with inherited qualities, it's only to do with economic factors, according to Marx. And when we're at work, what we should be striving to do is effectively even those things up, and all work should be much more um, egalitarian in that sense. And you'll know that that leads him to the thought about communism, where w wealth should be equally shared. Now, that all sounds pretty uh, compelling in some ways, but there's a completely <coughs> different take on it, and I'll talk about Max Weber, who has an utterly different notion of what capital is and how, how work works. Um, Weber's own background was um, kind of Calvinist, or at least his mother was a Calvinist. And he got to a rather different conclusion. He said, hang on a minute. If you work very hard and you've got the self-discipline not to spend the money you've been paid, you will accumulate savings. Yeah. So you work hard during the week, you get paid at the end of the week, and you don't go and blow it on Friday night. You save money. And that savings are for Weber, not the source of bad capital, as it is for Marx, but good capital, because it proves that you've been virtuous. 
So the accumulation of capital is the demonstration of virtue in favor. Where in Marx it's the other way around. The accumulation of capital is the demonstration of vice and being overpaid. In Weber, it's the other way around. Work hard, don't spend much, you will accumulate capital. And you can be proud of that because it is the source of good wealth. And this leads him to say that capitalism is fundamentally aligned with Protestantism. So, that, you know, capitalism actually has a religious motive, which is to work hard, or a, an ethical motive, which is to work hard and save money, which means capital, capitalism, is in his view, a fundamentally religious or Protestant ethic. Hence, the very famous phrase, the Protestant work ethic. And that's what, uh, that's what it's about. Two completely different notions of what money means at work. So when you're working, you might want to reflect on exactly that, you know, which, whether you've got a Marxist or a Weberian, Weberian setup. And uh, finally, I'll just talk about going to parties in the company of Machiavel, most wonderful picture of him. Um, <laughs> what on earth does Machiavelli have to do with parties? Well, um, <laughs> Machiavelli himself probably attended quite a lot for a start because he was a diplomat. And as you know, the kind of core business of a, a diplomat is attending parties. Um, or, or, well, in fact, my daughter's just been um, made a diplomat, actually, just joined the Foreign Office. And it's clear that the other key function of a diplomat, apart from attending parties, is to defer decisions. This seems to be the, the core capability in the Foreign Office. And uh, <laughs> you might say that's a bad thing, but in some ways, of course, in a diplomatic environment, it's the ideal thing, because the more you defer decisions, the more you reduce the possibility of conflict, in a sense. Because once you get to a decision, people divide over it. So, it's, you know, it's George Orr rather than War War. Um, so if in the Foreign Office decisions are hard to come by, it, it's actually quite, it's got quite a, a useful bilateral, multilateral purpose. Anyway, a small digression on the Foreign <laughs> Office. Um, <clears throat> Machiavelli, what does he have to say about parties? Well, um, you'll know that, um, this book, The Prince. You know, you've heard of the famous guidebook called The Prince, which is annoyingly higher up the Amazon ratings than my book currently uh, in the philosophy section. Um, <clears throat> And what, um, what the print is about, I mean, it's a guidebook. It's a practical, it was written as a handbook for people in power. Uh, hence the prince, or principe. And his advice to princes, having worked with a lot of them and been a courtier and so on, is that, among other things, the most important thing for a prince is to maintain your state. And he has this wonderful <laughs> phrase, Italian phrase, mantenere lo stato. The prince has to maintain his state. Because after all, when you're at the top, the only way is down. And therefore, the Machiavellian advice for going to a party would be, first of all, to construe a party as an opportunity to demonstrate your social capital. You might think it's a time to just hang out and review the week or chat with friends. But actually, every social and political environment is saturated with politics, small p. And therefore, when you find yourself at a party, you should do whatever you can to shore up your cultural, social, political capital and maintain your state. And if we have this phrase about being Machiavellian, uh, you know, that's right, because in a sense, uh, parties are precisely the point where you disabuse yourself of the illusion that they're for fun and you start to work the room. So when we, uh, net, you know, if you think of networking, this is a very Machiavellian phenomenon, because what we're trying to do when we go to networking events is effectively to build our social, political capital with a view, actually, to building other kinds of capital in the long run. So this notion of networking at parties <laughs> kind of has its roots, albeit <laughs> the genealogy of this thought gets a bit misty at certain points, but it has its roots in this kind of Machiavellian notion of what it is to be in a socio-political environment, and a party is a, is a classic example of that. But if you, uh, but there's a completely different way of interpreting it. Because the other thing that parties are about, if you go to parties or receptions and so on, is obviously about friendship. And perhaps the best corrective to a Machiavellian view of the world is that of Montaigne, who's writing about 100 years after, after Machiavelli. And for Montaigne, friendship, as it was for Aristotle, is one of the greatest sources of happiness in life. Now, Aristotle is very clear about this. Arist Aristotle thought 
we must live our whole lives trying to be happy or good. And friendship for him was one of the key ways to achieve happiness in life. And when it comes to Montaigne, he sort of e echoes Aristotle a bit. And the important thing about friendship and Montaigne is that there is um, perfect parity and equality between the friends. As soon as one person tries to best the other or get the better of the other, the friendship dies, according to Montaigne and indeed according to Aristotle. So friendship is about that mutual gaze of equals. So if you, if you think about the friends you might have, if there's ever any sense that you have that I'm a bit superior to him or she's a bit inferior to me, you are destroying the principle of friendship. You know, if there's even a flicker of that, uh, then friendship you know, is not what's happening. And a party should be quite the opposite of a Machiavellian structure, where in, where in Machiavelli a party would, as it were, be a vertical line where people are trying to climb the social ladder to get higher up it, basically. In Montaigne, you know, on the contrary, it needs to be a complete horizontal where everybody is equal with everybody else. And um, just actually, just one other word on uh, friendship, because um, like anybody who's signed up to Facebook, as I've done very recently, I've become addicted to uh, checking how many friends I've got and all those things. <laughs> seeing how popular I am or otherwise, and uh, how many friends my friends have, and why have they got so many more than me, and all the rest of it. And Aristotle has very interesting thoughts in his, in his uh, treatise on Facebook. Um, it wasn't called that at the time, but it effectively was. Um, he says, the reason um, we have this phenomenon called Facebook friends now, as opposed to real friends, is that there are two categories of friendship. One are real, genuine friends, where that friendship will last forever, and uh, there is that equality that, that I was talking about. But the other type of friendship is based on, he calls them useful friendships, it's based on structures and institutions. So typically, you, I'm sure, will have been friends with people in a job, only to see that once you've left, left the job, six months later, a year later, you lose touch with them. So the friendship lasts while you're in the job, but then, then fades away. And what Aristotle says is, yeah, well, that's precisely because that friendship was based upon the institution, the structure, the usefulness of the contact between you. But you take that away, and then the friendship disappears too. So Facebook is a classic example of useful friendship. And if you think, it's very odd to put your genuine best friend on Facebook. It's kind of, they're your best friend anyway. Why, why would they be on Facebook? So it's quite interesting to notice that peop people don't put their best friends on Facebook because it's, it's serving a different function. And when Facebook, if it ever finally subsides or dies, you'll note that quite a lot of the Facebook friends you had will also disappear into the, into the ether too. So anyway, just a, a word on friendship. Um, and I guess the point throughout this is, is precisely this. This is Annie Dillard, who's uh, the Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, She's written, uh, writing her autobiography. She says this, you know, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. You know, there's nowhere else we spend our lives. Um, well, it makes me think of that Philip Larkin poem, Days. Days, uh, what are days for? Days are where, the, where we live. They come, they wake us, time and time over. Where can we live but days? So there's a sense in which um, the day is everything we have. And therefore, reflecting on our days is a way of reflecting on our lives. Or to use that other... Um, phrase, uh, if you want to change your life, change your habits. And it's that idea of zooming in to the, the small things in life and then getting to the big things through them. Partly because the other questions but can become so unwieldy. You know, if you think about money or truth or lying or faith or reason or doubt, it can be very hard to get a purchase on those things. But if you can begin to integrate them and attach them to how you live your everyday life, they come alive for you and become meaningful and relevant in a way that I think gives you more choices and enables you ultimately to have a little bit more freedom. So that is the idea. Breakfast with Socrates, available at every good greasy spoon. Um, and uh, I think we've got time for some questions now. Yeah.